Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. This is Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents, episode number 74. I'm Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks, and joining me is Mr. Brian Smith. Welcome uh, welcome back, Brian. Hey, Eric. How are you doing today? Oh, not too bad. Uh, had some fun on Friday. Uh, you and I did. We we snuck into the end of the terminal studio, and we, we took over for an episode. We were talking about uh, GNOME tips and tricks, and... Uh, and we all learned something from that episode. I've gotten so many comments. People are like, I didn't know Gnome could do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If anyone wants to see it, go check out the uh, the recording of it. It was, it was really, it was fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to grab the link and throw it in chat. It was it was fun uh, doing a Rel Presents takeover of Into the Terminal. Uh, we, we didn't we didn't present anything, but we but we definitely terminaled a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, so, wow, thank, uh, Mr. B, thank you. Really, right off the bat, I, I, I swear I did not pay for this comment, but Mr. B says, I'm excited that this channel and series is building up to nearly 100 hours of pure RHEL admin-related content. That's big, especially for free. Uh, Mr. B, thank you very much. I really appreciate the feedback. Um, we, uh, we really do. Uh, this, is, this is one of my predominant projects this year. Um, so I think you'll see some uh, ongoing improvements. We're, we're taking a look at metrics, taking a look at what are people searching for. So if you have any uh, suggestions for appropriate content, anything that you'd like to see, by all means, put it in the chat, put it in the comments after the episode's over. Uh, we love to hear from all of you. Now, Brian, I said a lot, which I always do, but I'm really excited because we've had an episode in the works for a few months now for a feature that's been in tech preview for I think about 500 years. It's been, it's been uh, almost five years. Yeah. Since uh, rel 8.0. <laughs> so of course we are talking about Stratus and it is not a file system. Let me, let me de debunk that, that myth right up front. It is not a file system, but we didn't figure you'd want to listen to Brian and I talk about it the, the entire time. So let me uh, let me bring on uh, our first guest and we'll we'll do some introductions. If I can click the button. There we go. Mr. Bob Hanlon, welcome back to Rel Presents, my friend. If, if you're not on mute. <laughs> oh, so, you know, I have dogs and go. keyboards and there's multiple mutes available here. And you get to there tour the whole group. So sorry about that. <laughs> hey, glad to be back. Yeah, hey, Bob, yeah. Can, you, uh, can you introduce yourself for anyone who might not? Uh, I'm Bob Hanlon. I'm an experienced product manager at Red Hat. And when I first came to Red Hat, I was working on uh, storage stuff. And Stratus was at, sort of at the center of that and had a lot of customer conversations and sort of helped shape the plan for Stratus as it slowly emerged. And it, it, it took them, and you know, as you guys know, it took a minute, as you mentioned already. But part of that is it's a uh, it's a storage target. We don't always do storage as a target at Red Hat, but when you're a target, the bar goes up. You want to do a better job with things like data protection and data management. So anyway, I, I, I've watched it go by. I don't spend my days all day on storage anymore, but I certainly watched this thing grow and change. Awesome. Well, welcome back to the show. Um, so last episode, two weeks ago, we actually did a day in the life of a solutions architect. And out of that episode, we, uh, I don't know if we call him a volunteer or if I kind of grabbed him by the collar and pulled him on the show, but we actually have a solutions architect with us today, Mr. Billy Holmes. Hey there, everybody. Glad Welcome to be here. Welcome to Rail Presents. Yes. So, so why, don't, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do for yeah. Red Hat, what you do for fun, you know, the usual, uh, the usual getting to know you piece. So my name is Billy Holmes. I'm a solutions architect, a specialist solutions architect. I focus on RHEL, also what we would call platform. I've been with Red Hat coming up on 10 years. I've used Linux since it was 27 floppy disks that you had to download from Usenet. Uh, please don't do the math on that. Um, <laughs> so, so what do I do You know, as, as a you know, role here? So I know you had Chuck Marshall. You just mentioned he was here uh, March sixth uh, for Dana Life of an essay. It's it's like that, but I'm going to condense it down uh, into into three things. Normally, when people ask, you know, what I do, I joke and I say my job is to talk a lot, and and that's true. But in reality, it's communicate, listen, and be passionate. 
I, I communicate with meetings, presentations, demos, and emails. And I via and, and I get the fuel for that via tinkering and playing with our products and learning them you know, deeply. I also listen to what the customers need from me, from Red Hat, from the products, and how they're using the technology. And I take what I learn from that and I you know close the loop, you know, communicate that back to people like Bob and you know engineering so that we can understand you know, how our customers are using our products and feed that back into engineering. And I'm also passionate about learning and about helping. I have a huge desire to learn new things, to deep dive in what I think I know and contribute code or documentation when I can. So what I do for fun, I like woodworking. I like, you know, working with, you know, lumber and building stuff. And uh, I've built shelves uh, Our kitchen table is actually, you know, what I built. I'm not a carpenter. I'm not that great, you know, carpenter, measure twice, cut once. I'm more like, measure five times and cut three times and then throw it away and then get another piece. Uh, I like computer <laughs> games, first person shooter, Mario, even played some MUDs and D and D, you know, when I used to have the time and I got kids, they're in Girl Scouts. So we're busy doing that. Uh, cookie season's over. So I'm sorry, everybody um, can't get <laughs> cookies from me. Um, swim team summer, right. Coming up and gymnastics. So during the summer, we're, totally booked um you know but that's pretty much me in a nutshell and and you know juggling you know being a solutions architect so it's it is i've told people this is the best job i've ever had very cool so let's let's start we already have one question in in the chat here about you know what exactly is stratus can can one of you guys just cover an overview of, of what what stratus is I'd rather I mean, have I, Billy do it. No one here. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely <laughs> go into it. Uh, you know, so Stratus is not doing anything um, that is foreign system or to the Linux stack. It's using all the technologies that are in Linux today. Is wrapped an API around it to make it a cohesive singular tool. So creating, um, so it, in the past, if you want to create a thin volume with a caching block um, and, you know, at some point make a snapshot of that, I don't know about you, but for me, I have to go to the man page to look on the nuances of doing that. We, like I can create a PV, I can create a volume group, and I can pick, create an LV. Like I can do that all day long. But you want me to do something a little strange, like add a cache, or tear cache down, or you know make it a thin volume? What what is it? Is it a dash dash thin? Is it dash dash thin pull? Is it that you know how do I make the thin pull metadata? I, I don't know. I got to look at the man page. I got to look at examples. It it is complex and difficult. And LVM the command that does all these things, it, the man page is huge. It does a lot of things underneath the covers. Stratus is super simple. It brings all that together into one tool and takes a lot of the complexity out. And additionally, when you add something like uh, Lux encryption, there are a lot of nuances in that. And Stratus makes it super easy um, in particular to add encrypted volumes. And I, and I can show you guys what that looks like in a little bit. So we, we mentioned, you know, earlier that, um, you know, Stratus has been in tech preview and rel for quite a while since, since rel 8.0, but we recently did have a change to that. Um, so can we talk about what, what happened in rel 9.3 in relation to Stratus and, and support? Well, Stratus is now supported in rel 9.3. Uh, there are some caveats, right? It, it is not supported for your root volume. So you're not going to boot up on a Stratus volume, right? Yeah, um, the tools are there. I think that part is still in tech preview, right? If you want to, um, if you want to boot up a a system that is running on top of Stratus, you can you can do that. Um, if it breaks, though, you're going to have a very high friction support event. Uh, so I don't recommend doing that for anything production. Uh, you know, there is, um, and and there's also a lot of work going on to in, in Stratus. You know, today so there's work adding it into our system roles. There's there's work 
being done to add things like uh, virtual data optimizer, you know, the video, which if anyone's aware, video just got merged into the mainline kernel, uh, the upstream uh, mainline kernel uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and adding things like DM integrity um, and, and things like that to, to Stratus is, is on the horizon. It's a goal. It's motive, it, our, our engineering team is motivated to have those features and capabilities in, in Stratus. And so it's a work in, those pieces are a work in progress, but the pieces that we have today that are in RHEL are fully supported, um, not for root volume or you know, boot volume, but fully supported for you know, data volumes. And just the rationale there, we, we discussed it a lot about when to take it out of the, you know, take the training wheels off, if you will, is we don't really, you know, we tested a lot and we did a lot of work with really some very experienced storage people to make sure it was right. But you never know how people are going to break it until you actually give it to them. And tech preview is fine for what it is, but not a lot of people do difficult things with something. They may look at it, but they don't really test it until it's in, in GA and in production. So we thought this was the right way to bring it out. Yeah, and, and storage is one of those things that uh, pretty much every sysadmin takes for granted because you put your bits on a disk and you expect the bits to be there. Yes. And everybody's happy until that disk is either full or fails or in the case of maybe poorly written file system, the bits that were there yesterday Corrupted. aren't there today. And people <laughs> yes. seem to get really, really upset about that. I'm, I'm just not sure why. Yes, storage is one of those things that you don't want to treat treat haphazardly, right? Or 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 you know shoot from the hip, you know wild wild west, right? Yeah, like storage is not one of those things, um, and you could get really deep. Uh, there, there, there's a group I'm in in social media. It's called uh, it's a it's about dull things, dull you know information. And I posted there recently about my experiences with one of my hard drives going bad, and about you know mean time between failure. And about you know errors you know between bits, so storage is very important, and we don't want to be haphazard in how we treat that. And as Red Hat, we look at it. You know, I tell people the difference between something that's supported and not supported is: is Red Hat going to put their brand and their name and their reputation behind it, and can we give an SLA on support for it? <laughs> yeah, that's and, a that's and, good point. I, I don't think a lot of people realize. Um, just kind of how big of like of a commitment it is when something's added to rel because you know there's a lot that goes along with that as far as you know the rel life cycle and you know being supported throughout the life cycle etc so we're all super super excited that stratus is finally you know generally available and supported as of rel 9.3 um so one question i had you, you know one of the main features of stratus you mentioned is like it's very simple um to understand and use um, can you talk about the three main components that make up, you know, Stratus that, you know, are kind of the building blocks for, for everything you're doing in Stratus? Yeah, I mean, it, it mirrors a lot of what LVM is like, right? So you, you have, you know, block device, you have a pool, and then you have a file system. And there are layers that sit in those places, and you... Um, Each of it, it, the layers are are very dependent upon one another. Uh, a primary example of this, um, I'm going to pick on VDO for a little bit. Is you, if you want encryption and deduplication and encryption, you can't put encryption before deduplication encryption because then your dedupe and your your compression layer are trying to compress encrypted data and dedupe. Decrypt, you know, encrypted data, and you, you can't do that. Everything looks like random, so you have to put it below. So it's it's important, you know, the order of things. And Stratus, the, the Stratus team and the Stratus you know project understands the order of things, and that's what makes it so successful. So let's let's kind of talk. Let's. let's that's that's a great ten thousand foot view. Why don't we zoom in a little bit? And I think you've got like an architecture drawing here. That yes, I got a slide, a PowerPoint. Yeah, stuck it in on me, for right? Me. But uh, it's fault. only two. It's only two slides. Um, I don't ha like having uh, <laughs> lots of slides. So this is your traditional, you know, stack, right? You can software RAID, 
you know, maybe hardware array, you know, Lux, which, you know, is the encryption layer. You can add caching, snapshots, and, and, and to the left are the commands that actually do those things for you, right? You know, make a fast LVM, crypt setup, MD admin. And you have to be aware of what layer in that stack you're doing these things because if you do it wrong then it, it doesn't work very well right or you end up you know um you know stepping on your own feet you know so to speak you know tripping yourself up um so what does stratus look like well the stratus stack is the same technologies but now stratus handles these things and for in this example software array is still handled by md you know, md adm um but to keep in mind that that's on the roadmap, it's on the goal to have that included in the Stratus. So in the future, we may look at the slide and the whole thing will be managed by Stratus. So, so I want to call attention to uh, a conversation that uh, Shantanu and uh, Bob are having uh, in, in the chat. Let me pull up. Um... So yeah, be ready, Bob. I'm, I'm calling you out here. Shantanu asks, from a 10,000-foot view, it looks like this is Red Hat's answer to ZFS, HammerFS, LVM2, and a pile of other tools that we uh, that we come across. So, Bob, I think you had a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good uh, chat response, but I'd I'd love to hear you add some more color to this. So, uh, it so I guess sort of, but with an entirely different approach. If you look at the way ZFS was built, and then for that matter, ButterFS is similar, where they build a storage stack that goes from raw disk all the way up to presenting a file system out, and every feature is self-contained. There's some advantages to that in terms of optimizations, okay? But you have to create every single function in the stack by hand, and, re and it's different than the one that may maybe is already in Linux, for example. Uh, what we're doing instead with Stratus is we're saying, we can layer the things that are already there as Billy showed on his slide. But as you do that, the trick is you can also automate the best practice use of each layer, which is the hardest thing to do if you're a system admin trying to master, you know, Billy said you have to go to the man page and read up on LVM. We're trying to get away from that. We're trying to say that, you know, this is not new stuff. We know how to do certain things optimally at each layer of these stacks. If we can, hide that complexity from you and change it into i want it to work this way and have the command do the right things under the covers that's a better world it, better still is that once you begin to do that you start to learn how to better optimize and you may gradually become something like a zfs or an integrated stack like performance capability because you're learning as you go to make that thing more and more optimal and then you don't lose stability because you're using stuff that's already there so so we talked about you know encryption in stratus um but does stratus support things like um snapshotting um over provisioning stuff like that oh 100 percent. it it absolutely does and it uses the th the thin uh, provisioning aspect of LVM in order to do those things, um, and, and that's kind of where the layering and the complexity and you know where stuff sits in the stack you know makes sense. Um, it, it also adds some caveat to this, like you don't want to put Stratus on top of a already thin provisioned volume, right? You don't want thin on top of thin. Right, it's kind of like putting encryption on top of encryption, or trying to dedupe, you know, something that's already you know encrypted. Right, so the, the layers are important uh, in in that regard. It, it also does things uh, like over provision, right, where you can, particularly with thin volumes, right. This is not new technology, but it's particularly with thin volumes where I I'm only count my file systems are only counted against me based upon how much they're using not how much I've allocated. So I may allocate on a 10 gig physical disk, I may allocate, you know, 10 file systems that are 10 gigs each. But in reality, if they're only using one gig total, then that's all that I'm actually being penalized for, or being accounted for, is that, you know, one gig across the all. It allows you to do, um, 
do things like managing snapshots a little easier. It allows you to do, uh, especially with things like virtualization, allows you to optimize your storage and now around virtualization. Um, there are some concerns when it comes to uh, thin provisioning. You want to make sure you don't run, run out of storage space, right? Um, you know, so there's, you know, I'm going to talk about some monitoring that you can do later on um, with that because, you know, thin provisioning is a great tool, but it, you you can trip yourself up if you're too confident, you know, in, in what you have versus what you actually, you know, have physical storage for. Yeah, that's a good point. I think I think uh, a lot of people, especially system administrators, their first reaction to, you know, over provisioning stuff like that is, you know, kind of they're hesitant to, to do that because, they, you know, you don't want to you don't want to run out of space. You don't want to have a downtime because, you know, um, things got out of hand and, and more space was used than you have, et cetera. So why don't you talk about like how, how do you monitor stress? How do you prevent that kind of issue from coming up? Well, you know, th there are lots of ways to monitor the system. I think it comes back to um, there are different tools to monitor. And if I'm going to, the things you should be focused on monitoring are, you know, if, you know, if you're using RAID, in, in this demo, I'm going to be showing RAID and pull allocation. So for this particular demo, you should be monitoring the RAID, right? If it, if it fails or something goes bad, that you want to be able to replace the disk. And pool allocation. You want to make sure you don't, you know, run out of storage. So you can use a lot of the tooling that comes with Linux today. You can use the Stratus command line and the Stratus reporting to pull that information. So you can be aware. So it's not just DF, right? Because DF is only going to tell you what it thinks it knows. You want to look at the storage pool. You want to look at the file system sizes. You want to see, and, and and you can also turn over provisioning off, right? So if you if you don't want to worry about those things, if you turn over provisioning off then it's not going to let you over deploy, right? It's not going to let you, you know, each file system will consume, you know, that much. If, if in the VM world, it's like pre-provisioning your disk, right? If you turn over provisioning off versus uh, thin provisioning, you know, your disk for a, vir for a virtual machine. Um, hey, my thin provision disks, you know, before I install anything on it, it's only 500K. And after I install something, you know, after I install something on it, now it's a gig. You know, it's just kind of the same thing. Um, but then... You know the tools are there, but now you got alert on it, and so you know I recommend stuff like Zapix, which is a great monitoring tool. It's open source, has a lot of features. Ansible automation platforms run playbooks and collect you know all the metric information and then alert on it. You could also push it to uh, to your logs to Splunk. You could even uh, enable Performance Copilot, and then you can push that information to Splunk or push that information to Ansible or, or have Zapix report on it. And finally, you could even set up Grafana and Prometheus and set up a node exporter. Um, I haven't done that. Um, it looks super cool. So if that's, um, you know, it, it all comes down to like, you know, the build versus buy conversation, right? Like how much, you know, and, and when you're monitoring stuff, you, know, you can, we have all the tools available that you could build it you know yourself or do you want to use something like Zabbix or you know ansible automation platform or splunk right to actually give you something enterprise that you can actually view across your entire portfolio of servers very cool so i think what do you think eric you think we've talked about this enough should we see a demo of how this actually works you know i would love to see how this works that's great. So I have, I'm using um, so the first, the first scenario for this, I'm going to use what I call the easy button. So the easy button in my mind is, this is called Cockpit Web Console. It comes uh, with RHEL. Uh, you can install it or not. It uses uh, port 9090. And of course, this is SSL, um, you know, encrypted. You can see my connection is secure. You know, this is actually a let's encrypt uh, certificate that I, you know, built for this. Um, and you, um, there's several modules you can install. Uh, one of them is I installed all the mod. I said all the modules. Uh, some of these don't make sense. This is an AWS instance. I'm not going to be running virtual machines on this thing, uh, right? Because nested vert is not supported on AWS. Um, 
at least I never could get it to work. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the storage, uh, you know, module for this. So if you see, I have three disks right now. I have my root volume, and then I have two other disks. Um, and I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is I want to create a RAID device. So I'm going to put those two disks, I'm going to make them into one single RAID disk. Now, if I could create a stratus pool of those two disks, but it's not going to RAID them. It's going to just join them together into one large pool. That's, that's not what I want to do right now. So I'm going to create this RAID disk. I'm going to create RAID 1. I'm going to do mirroring, and I'm going to select the two drives that I want to be included in the RAID array, and I'm going to hit Create. And if you notice at the bottom here, under jobs, I have this synchronized RAID job running. And it will you know, run till it's complete. I can still use this drive while it's being created. It's in what's called degraded mode, as it's trying to you know, re... Um, ZFS folks calls it re-silver. Uh, this would be rebuilding in the RAID world. So now I'm going to create a stratus pool. So I go back to the, I call it the hammer here under devices. Um, I, I literally think that's what it's called. Um, so I'm going to create a pool here. I'm going to create my block device. I'm going to encrypt the data with a passphrase. And I'm just going to use my super secret password of Red Hat123. Please don't tell anybody what it is. Uh, and then I'm going to manage file system size. And, I, and, and that's because I... By default, this is going to consume the entire block device whenever I create a, a file system. And I don't want to do that because I want to create multiple file systems. Huh. If you notice here, I can also use something called a tank server. If you're not sure what a tank server is, in, in a real short, succinct answer, a tank server is the network server that allows you to do something called network uh, block encryption. Uh, and the idea here is instead of using a passphrase that I have to type in, what if I, what if my computer could go, go authentically grab, you know, via some kind of authentication mechanism? I think it's use public keys. Grab a key from the Tang server that it then uses to unlock its storage volume when it boots up. So I don't actually store the password for the storage volume on my server. I actually go get it from something else, right? Um, and then the, the idea of, of um, locking down and keeping that Tang server secure, right? Using trusted computing modules and, you know, you know, things like that. That's a whole different, you know, scenario, but at least my server that I'm working with right now, I can just go grab my password from that Tang server and over the network. But I'm not going to do that for this particular demo because I am not 100% familiar with Tang. Yeah, they sometimes call that network bound disk encryption too, because it means that that drive will only work on that network. Right. Yeah, we we previously, um, I think maybe a year or two ago, ago did a did an episode of Rel Presents and talked all about Lux encryption and network bound disk encryption as well. If people want to go back and, and look at that. So I just created my stratus pool and it now pops up here under my devices so i click that and i'm just going to create a new file system uh, so here i'm going to do test one i'm going to give it uh, two gigs and i'm going to give it a mount point of test one and i could from this this interface i could give you know custom mount options um, it's going to I'm going to do mount without waiting. I'm going to do ignore failures. And the reason for that is the reason I want that on this particular one is that it's an encrypted device. And if I reboot, it's going to ask me for the password again. Um, and I don't want it to fail, you know, boot up. Um, so I will just do that. So I'll create the, the volume and boom, there's my volume. And if I go to my terminal, which is also in this web console, uh, I can do a DF, and I can see that my mount um, test one is there mounted on that stratus volume. And if I do dash H, I can see that it is a two gig file system, and I have 1.8 gigs free on it. So 
that is through this is what i call the easy button right it's the cockpit cons uh, web console and i just created this stratus volume using that but there's also other ways of doing this you can use command line um, so i'm going to go ahead and delete all of this um you know via the the web console uh, including the raid and i'm going to duplicate these um steps using the command line and let's see if i could go back here so let me clear my screen so I can type a little easier uh let's see let me pull up my commands so and uh, i believe you've got go all of your uh i believe you've got your entire demo documented out on github do you not i do and i and i will share that at the end um, because i don't want everyone to go off and you know start reading my github and, and not listen to what i have to say <laughs> Um, I've already downvoted all of your projects. Don't worry. <laughs> oh man. Um, <laughs> so I, I do have a uh, time warp dance in assembler. It's probably, um, you know, one of my, my worst projects, but, uh, it was fun, fun to write if you wanted to nerd out on that. Um, so the, the command line, I'm going to cut. So I have a GitHub for this. So after, you know, I'm done, you guys can go to my GitHub, this Stratus demo you can check out the project and you can do all of these things including uh, and I have screenshots for the, the console and um, i have the text of the commands it would actually run and, and there's even an ansible playbook that actually would do this stuff as well so the first thing that i'm going to do is just like i did in the web console was create the raid so i oh so you got to be super user. That makes sense. So let me log in as, as a super user. So I'm going to, so it's complaining because the, uh, the it recognizes, hey, there was something else here before. Uh, yes, I know. I'm going to write it anyways. So I overwrote, um, I should have used wipefs on this before I did. So I've created the rated disk. You could see that it is being created. And if I cat that, that proc, file you could see you know the status of it i can also look at it using uh, journal um, uh, ctl and i can see you know the md adm is uh is doing this doing the things right it's, it's uh, rebuilding um the array as we speak it looks like it's done that's true oh no it's like almost done um the so while that's running, I can build the Stratus pool. So the first thing I have to do when you're doing encrypted Stratus is you have to give the, um, you have to create the key. So um, right now I'm doing it from the command line. Um, oh, so I already have the key. So let me. So let's pretend that that key uh, doesn't exist. Uh, we're gonna set. So now we're gonna create the key. And what this does is it creates a, key, a cryptographic key and it puts it in the kernel. Well, there's, there's a special place in the kernel for these things. And I'm going to type in that super uh, secret password um, that you're not supposed to tell any about. And now it's in the kernel. And so I can reference it with that text, my key. And that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to create the, the, the pool. Um, notice I'm doing no over provision. Um, just like I... I treating it the same way as the web console did. And that should be created here in a little bit. I think it takes oh, three seconds. And if I run the Stratus pool, oops, I guess I should spell Stratus correctly. I can see that there's my pool. It's nine gigs total. And I have these properties. And you can see this little property right here that I have highlighted the tilde op means no over provision means um, and this alert um, and I think this is the command oh no I got it wrong so it is So what that error code means is it says every device in the pool has been fully allocated to 
is kind of giving you um, and I think Stratus does. It has different alert codes that you could key off of if you're doing any kind of monitoring. So this would tell you that my pool isn't full, but I've I've earmarked it, all of it, for stuff. Just to just so you're aware. So now I'm going to create a file system on it using the command line, and of course I'm using some fancy bash math because I'm actually doing you know two million bytes here so my file system is created and if i run stratus fs i could see that my file system is created and then the next thing is this is some fancy bash footwork for, to extract out the uuid and then i'm going to put that uuid in my fs tab so notice if I cat my FS tab, there's my UUID for my file system that I'm going to mount. And of course, with system D, uh, whenever you do that, you have to tell system D to, to refresh the mount uh, FS tab. And then I mount it. And then now my Stratus uh, file system is now mounted in the same spot that I had it before. And so that's what it looks like from the command line. Yeah, there's a few more commands than doing it from the cockpit uh, web console interface, but really there's like three commands. And I have a, a thin provisioned encrypted um, backed by RAID, you know, software, uh, software RAID 1 file system um, using Stratus and using MVADM. So about three commands in order to make this happen, which well, I guess four if you add, you know, I created the, the encryption key. You know, so that was, well, that was one command. So, you know, four commands in order to do this. If, if I was to duplicate the same behavior, which, you know, that's something I should probably add to, like, uh, my GitHub is to let's duplicate the steps using LVM. Like, what would those steps look like? This would be represented by probably just some back-of-the-napkin math about 10 to 15 commands, right? Just to kind of do the same thing. Um, you know, particularly if you wanted to um, add Lux and if you wanted to, um, uh, it, I don't have it here, but if you wanted to add a caching volume with Stratus, it's um, it's super easy to add caching to this thing. Um, I don't have it up. I'm not going to bumble through the man page, but the, um, Stratus has support for caching volumes as well. Um, you could do that with LVM. It, I've done it before. It's just always scary to me when you're adding a cache volume because it's like, you know, is this the right command to use? You know, is, is, you know, I have enough metadata size, blah, blah, blah. Um, Stratus takes all of that care and worry away uh, when you, you know, add a you know, cache volume like that. I have one more way of doing this if you guys are interested. Um, but it's using an Ansible playbook to, to do the same steps. The only thing I'm going to do in order to make that happen is I'm going to delete all of my, um, all, all the stored, you know, the, the file system and the RAID array. First, I'm going to delete it so I get back to a pristine scenario and so now i'm back with just my root volume and my three quote unquote empty drives i'm going to go back to my terminal clear my screen so oop, i'm root i don't want to i'm i don't want to run my ansible playbook as as root i want to run it as my you know, service account user or Ansible user in this case. So for here, uh, if you ever ran an Ansible playbook, it's um, not incredibly difficult. I give it my inventory and I give it my playbook. And I have this particular playbook um, using Ansible best practices, right? I have an inventory file, I have group variables. Um, actually, let me show you that before we go too far. I have roles, and my roles do, you know, various things. I have 
a Stratus info role, Stratus encryption key, you know, Stratus pool and a Stratus file system role. And they all do their own little, you know, particular thing. So if I look at my, um, my, my variables for storage, I can see where I'm defining my RAID, right? Here are my RAID, my devices, the level, you know, the name that I want. And I'm defining my Stratus, you know, pool that I'm creating. Here's my pool name, my state, you know, where the provisioning is true this time, which is that's different than what I did in the other two examples. And I'll let it give my devices an encryption key. Oh, you're not supposed to see my encryption password. Darn. Super secret. Don't tell anybody. Uh, and then my file systems. And so if I run this playbook, if if the gremlins are happy, it should run without a problem. That's the fun thing about live demos is uh, you, you never you never know if the gremlins are going to manifest themselves. Yeah, just, you can run just into of, no problems until. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add. Um, you know, there is Ansible Vault available. I'm sure you're. I'm sure you're aware of this, Billy. But for anyone else watching, there's Ansible Vault available, and and you can use that to encrypt things like the you know the Lux passphrase and stuff. So that's not in clear text yes. in your in your playbook. Yeah, I I could have added that, but I was I was in a hurry. There's there's no. Uh, uh, no explanation. Plus, I'd already given the password in the screenshots, you know, before. But yes, if to do this for real, you would use the Ansible Vault, or you would use, you know, something like, um, you know, an external vault, um, or you know, you could even pull it, you know, from you know an external source, right? Uh, do some kind of lookup. But the idea is, you wouldn't want it to be in, um, you know, clear text. And um, and that's it. So my playbook ran, and it created everything that it was supposed to create. It looks like it created a file system. If I look at my disks, I can see that my mount test one is there. If I look at um, Stratus pool, uh, I can see that my pool is there. And I can also see that my OP property no longer has a tilde in front of it because it's now over provisioned. Uh, and I can look at my file systems, and I can see, you know, what they what they look like. Um, the um, uh, so so to give me an example of what uh, Brian was talking about. Um, if I was to uh, vault encrypt, how do you spell encrypt? There we go. So uh, what's my password? Um, I don't know. One, two, three, four, five. That's that's the password to my luggage. So if we look at um, you know what this file looks like now, it, it looks like this, right? It's completely encrypted. I can't you know read it. I can't do anything with it. And if I was to uh, run this playbook again, so I'm not gonna run this playbook again per se. Uh, because I have a, um, I, I ran, I, I found a issue with system roles and the Stratus volume. It's, it's going to complain that it doesn't know what the Stratus volume is when it tries to create the RAID, because it's trying to, it wants to not like create the RAID if it already exists. Um, so I'm not going to show that right now, but I want to show what it would look like. Um, I can't remember what the vault stuff is. Oh, ask vault password. There we go. Ask vault password. So if I run this playbook again, it's going to say, hey, what's my vault password? If I don't put one in, it's it's not going to run my playbook because it's like, hey, I'm trying I found this vault. You gave me no secrets. I can't unlock this, you know, this this vault. So I I can't run. Right. And and um if you um look again. Uh, that's what it looks like. So it's like, I, I don't know what to do with it. So you typically with passwords and stuff, you would use a vault. And and that's pretty much all I have for the demo. There um, there was, someone had mentioned uh, maybe adding what it would look like for a snapshot. If you guys are interested in that, we have a few more minutes. Um, I don't use the console for this because it's, like I said, the web cockpit. If you're not familiar with cockpit, 
use cockpit. It's it's super easy to use. So for here, I'm going to create a snapshot, um, snap zero. I can even give it a mount point. Um, actually, I'm going to snap one. I'm going to mount it read only, uh, so, I, so I only get you know read access to it, and then it's going to create the snapshot. Snapshots take, um, depending on I/O activity and what's going on, uh, they may take a little bit of time because it has to like lock the file system and then you know take a snapshot of it. I, I guess it's called XFS freeze. Like is the the thing that go that's underneath, because you don't want the file system to be doing stuff when you then take a snapshot of. Because what happens is you then take a snapshot in the middle of it doing stuff, and it is not consistent. So you want it to be consistent. So now if I oop, go ahead, I say you just rationalize Stratus a little bit without trying in the sense that. You have to. You would have to do that. You have to. You'd have to stop I/O to the file system, then go make the snapshot, which is not at the file system layer. It's at the block layer. Blah 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 blah, etc. And oh, by the way, it's encrypted. And guess what? Yeah. How many of those things did you actually do? None, right? So boom, boom, right. boom. You get a snapshot. Yeah. So this is read only. So if I go back to my, you know, test, and then um, let's see what was the command I used. Um, I think it's var. Uh, oh, I can't do it because I'm not root. So I just copied var into that test, you know, file system, and I can see, hey, I got a bunch of stuff in var now. I don't have anything still in my snapshot because the snapshot's not going to show, you know, what, what was there because it wasn't there before. And um, so the idea, you know, if you're not familiar with snapshots, uh, particularly copy on write snapshots, the snapshots don't take any storage space as long as the differential between those, between that snapshot um, stays the same. So as, I, as soon as I added, um, I added data to my file system, now the, the snapshot, the, the delta between those is how much space that snapshot takes up if that makes sense. So yeah, I've, in this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense because I have no data in the snapshot, like it's an empty file system. But let's say I had, you know, a gig worth of movies in the file system. I made a snapshot of it. Then I deleted half of them. And then I added, you know, another, you know, 500 gigs of different movies to the volume. Well, now my snapshot would, the differential between those is a gig because I deleted 500 and I added 500 different content. And so the, the differential between that is is a gig. Um, so the snapshot would take up a gig of, of storage at that point um, because it has to track, you know, all the, all the changes, you know, that occurred. So this is something to think about when you're dealing with snapshots. Um, but it, it will continue to consume that information it, it, as the differential grows. You mentioned like something sort of unavoidable in, in provision environments and anything that does snapshots. At the end of the day, you have to track the capacity remaining in the pool. And the other thing you just kind of pointed out is it once a snapshot exists, deleting stuff doesn't necessarily get you space back. And that's really an important thing to keep in mind. So if you, Want to go down the road to Stratus, you're going to save a lot of space by not using space that you're not actually using, let's say. But you have to sort of pay attention to whether or not, like, you can add storage to an underlying logical volume if it comes to that. You know, you can expand the volume underneath the file system. But uh, the real trick, I, I, we have, I mean, ZFS and Butter have this concern as well. You always have to do this. Anything that thin provisions in any way, you have to watch because thin provisioning allows you to over provision with the idea that you can claim more space than there actually is. So that's the one, everything, doing things gets easier, but that one discipline has to be added to the way you think about storage to make everything sort of seamless and sync together well. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I use ZFS at home, right, for, for my, um, you know, my home uh, library where I, you know, store, you know, 
store things. I have my Git GitLab on there. I you know run some virtual machines off of it, you know, off of a network you know, network store. So I'm very familiar with ZFS. And you know, one of the things that you know you run into is I have a bunch of snapshots that I was running. And I remember on one particular file system, I was like, why why don't I have any more space on this file system anymore? Like I deleted a bunch of stuff. Like I should it should have freed up. And then I was like, oh, I have like a year worth of snapshots, you know, that I didn't clean up that still had references to the stuff that I deleted. So of course it's not freed up because it's still being referenced someplace else. And the uh, trash collection is pretty slow in ZFS. So you don't, it doesn't necessarily show up in the pool right away either. So again, it's just something you have to know when you, when you use that kind of technology, that's all. So that's what, um, that's what I, oh, so the, uh, what do you call it? Um, the GitHub. Um, so uh, let me see if I could, can I share? Uh, let me share this, if you don't mind. Can you see my different share? Did I share the right tab? Yep, I've also got the link printed on screen, and it'll be in the yep. show notes after the show. So this is the GitHub that has everything that I just showed today. Um, so there's no like fancy smoke and mirrors and hand waving and all that stuff. It's if you want to do exactly what I did today, go to go to the project, check it out yourself, run it. Um, I, I even list out some uh, prerequisites that you'll need. You know, this is, you know, RHEL 9.3. Um, I mean, I am a solutions architect or for Red Hat, so I'm going to talk about RHEL all day long. Um, if you know, there are some, if you want to run it on Fedora, there are some differences that you're probably going to run into, like, you know, the system roles, and you may have to download the community system roles, and, you know, maybe the versions might be different. I, I can't, you know, confirm nor deny if, if it'll work, but it sh the commands are there. Like it, it should, um, and probably even, you know, CentOS streams uh, or CentOS stream, no S, CentOS stream. Um, probably it would be nine, CentOS stream nine. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure about eight um, for this, but you know, if you guys, um, and and the and the other thing regarding um, Stratus is this. If one of the huge advantages of being a customer of Red Hat is being able to control your own destiny when it comes to our products. So if you have a need, if you have a, a business requirement that's not being met, if you have, if you recognize deficiencies in, in how the product's being used in your organization, reach out to your account team, reach out to your SA, advocate for that change we can that that's how engineering prioritizes work that's how we prioritize our work to do stuff so if we have a bunch of customers asking for something for stratus and a really cool feature that we kind of like to have in stratus we're going to focus on what our customers are asking for and that's where we're going to put our engineering work so th that is part of being a customer for a red hat use us communicate with us help us advocate for you because as a sale as in the sales team that's what i do like customers tell me like hey i i really need this then i go to engineering and i go to the bu and i say hey my customer really needs this and like in bob you know he's part of the bu somebody's like okay i've you already told me this <laughs> you know i get it you know like we're working on it you know but mm -hmm. but he lo they love hearing it because sometimes you know it's almost like a, it can be a vacuum where if there's no feedback it's kind of like are we doing are we doing what you, you want? Are we doing the right thing? And so having that feedback is really important to help Red Hat work more smoothly and our engineering give you the things that you need. 100%. Engineers are starved for it too. They, they, if there's something really interesting you want to talk about, it's not unusual to get someone who's actually working on development to jump on a call and talk about it a little bit too. So don't be shy about stuff like that. I think that's a great message. That's really good. And Billy, amazing demo uh, and, and really appreciate the the pitch for the account teams. Uh, it's almost like you work here. Um, 
if, if not, we should, <laughs> I, I, I know a company you should come work for. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour here. So I wanted to, I wanted to kind of go around the room as it were. Um, Bob, why don't you, uh, why don't you kick us off? Any closing thoughts, anything people should take away from, from this in particular? Well, we were chatting a little bit before any of this started. We were talking about concerns about how when you put something out into the world, you get a lot of naysayers and critics that look at it. And um, I think that dovetails very nicely to what Billy was just saying. If you believe that's true, you tell us what's missing and what you think you uh, what you need to see in it. And that's how we build a roadmap and that's how we get there. And it's open source. So if you happen to be a developer who was interested in watching this video, Make a pull request and add something yourself. It's out there. It's out there to be done. So, uh, absolutely um, open to all of those things. So, before this present, uh, before Rel presents, I was actually talking to one of the engineers for Stratus, and you know they, they were telling me they, we got stuff on the roadmap. We we're looking at RAID. We're looking at integrity. We're looking at reencrypt. Right. Um, they will. Ha they're happy to take questions on the GitHub. So even if you're not a Red Hat customer and you're just interested in Stratus as a project, it's on GitHub. You can leave issues. You can do pull requests. You can fork it, and you can. You know, it doesn't mean it's going to get accepted, right? But you can absolutely give your input that way. Um, and then another one is, um, you know, people have asked. Um, it was in the chat just now um, regarding. Uh, uh, remote syncing replication. Uh, that is, you know, on, um, it, it's in the design, it's being designed, right? It's being worked on, you know, or at least thought about as we speak. I, if I say it's in the roadmap, it's probably too strong of a phrase to use because, you know, there's still being, you know, thought about how are we going to accomplish that? What, what, you know, what, what does it look like? What are the, you know, steps that we have to do? What's the level of effort here? Um, but if you have suggestions, file a GitHub issue, right? Talk to your account team. Let us advocate for you. Yeah, and I can confirm that I know for a fact that the uh, Stratus development team reads the stuff that comes up in the Git. So by all means, play there too. That's probably the most direct way to have a conversation about Stratus with the developers is to just have a conversation on GitHub. I think it's it's, it's a great forum for that. Awesome. Brian, how about you? Closing thoughts? Yeah, so just wanted to point out one resource we have available. If anyone wants to try some hands-on um, experimentation with Stratus, we have a one of our uh, free lab environments where you can um, you know, try out Stratus in, in a lab environment. So um, check that out if you want to give, give it a try. All right. Uh, great episode again, Billy. Thank you very much for the uh, for the demo and taking it from three different angles. Uh, personally, uh, like I, I alluded to in chat, that uh, I've become a very lazy sysadmin since I don't provision new systems every day. So um, don't tell Brian because he'll get big head. Uh, but I, I tend towards web console. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of especially storage, especially with not wanting to remember fifteen LVM commands. Um, but yeah, web console, and especially when you're looking at, at a complicated storage solution like Stratus, it is so incredibly easy and so much harder to screw up when you're using the web console than, than uh, when you're, I uh, use web when you're using the so command much. <laughs> I, I, I look, I use it for checking logs. I use it for, I mean, I still use SSH from the command line to go in. Like I, I don't use the terminal on the web console as much just because my shortcuts and everything are just already there you know but i use the console for a lot of different things and um you know it's you know one thing i showed somebody is like logs looking at logs in web console is actually easier than looking at it from the command line because you have the filtering right there so anyways this, this could be this could be a show about cockpit so <laughs> well if if we're not talking web console then we're usually talking system rules which uh which Brian is has, has uh, under contract that we have to mention it every episode, or else he'll quit hosting. Rel presents with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we are at the end of our time together. Sorry, we got started a little late. We uh, we had a few different different screen shares and making sure resolution, all the live streaming things. There's 
you know, even even when the demo goes great, there's usually some kind of an issue. So it's not the demo; it's usually the pre presentation of the demo. So you never know what'll what'll happen. Awesome things going on in the rel uh, in the rel world. Uh, we've got Red Hat Summit coming up. I'm Brian. We dropped the ball. I don't remember why. I don't. I can't believe I didn't put that in the episode guide to to mention. But Red Hat Summit May sixth through the ninth. Uh, it's the first full week of May. Uh, we'll be in Denver, Colorado, so we're we're a little bit more centrally located for for U.S. folks. If you can, if you if you have to beg your manager, if if you have to drive Uber or or sell a kidney to come to Red Hat Summit, I highly, highly, highly encourage it. If if you like these sessions, and if you're crazy enough to stick. 61 minutes into it listening us to uh, listening to us talk imagine that for like three days straight hands-on workshops involved sessions i know mr handlin uh, himself is is doing a presentation um, so there's just so much going on um i think i think most of us will be there like I, mm -hmm. bob you've got a session brian you've got a session billy are you, are you going to make it to summit no it doesn't look like i'm going to make it this year Ah, I, I, I know we kind of rotate through people. Um, yep. I don't have a session this year, which means that I need all of you folks to come hang out with me at the rail booth and keep my life interesting. I might see about setting up a live stream or something from the booth. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, this is what happens when you don't give Eric a session and he has to come <laughs> up with other ways to keep himself entertained for three days. So stop by the booth. We'll have swag. We'll have people there to ask questions. We'll have demo stations. Red Hat Summit cannot oversell this at all. Come to Summit. It is absolutely awesome. And if that's not enough, uh, Ansible, um, Ansible Fest, really complicated name. Ansible Fest is now co-located with, uh, with Summit. So if, if RHEL itself is not enough to get you there, then come hang out for Ansible Fest. Lots of awesome sessions there as well. Keynotes for both. Uh, and I know all all three of our major products uh, have big announcements coming at Keynote. So if you can't make it, watch online. Some of the sessions, including the Keynotes, will be uh, streamed. Um, uh, Co-host Brian, can you do me a favor and grab the register link uh, for me real quick? Sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm talking and, and trying to type at the same time. It's not working. Uh, also coming up in two weeks on Rail Presents, we're going to have Mr. Rich Gerito himself. He'll uh, he'll be coming to talk about subscription updates, lifecycle, how to use activation keys. We haven't fleshed that episode all the way out yet, but there's always something exciting to talk about. Uh, we we realized and have admit, admitted publicly in years past that uh, using Rel is one of the hardest things about Rel, and. Uh, getting it activated, getting it registered, getting all the things. So uh, join us in two weeks with Rich Dorito. We'll talk a little bit about how to, uh, how, uh, what, what changes we're making, maybe a little bit of a sneak peek about what we're announcing at summit. Um, I'm, I got to keep an eye on Rich. He likes to tell more than, than he should. And then I get in trouble. Okay. That doesn't really happen, but it feels like it some days. And then last but not least, of course, we, we had the, <clears throat> excuse me, lost my voice. It's time to end the episode. Um, and then, of course, last week we had the uh, Bad Batch episode of Into the Terminal, which means that this Friday is the 100th episode. And kudos to anybody in chat that got the, the Star Wars reference there. But uh, um, ITT 100, Into the Terminal, we've got a special 100th episode uh, planned. Uh, we can blame uh, co-host Scott for this. We're going to do... For our 100th episode, we're going to mention 100 Linux commands. Last I saw, we were up around like 70 something. <laughs> so we probably better spend some time working on that. But we're going to try and list 100 commands. I tried to get them to do 100 commands in 100 minutes, but we're still shooting for that 30 to 40 minute range. So if you want to see some crazy antics and all three of us will be live, all, all three of the original hosts will be live on Friday, noon Eastern. Great thing to do to, to enjoy your lunch. So lots of great content. Uh, we're still putting uh, putting the wheels on a satellite management mini series. Um, so if, if you want to get started with satellite, we've we've got plans for that post summit. Um, so there's just so much going on, so many different things to see and hear. Um, so definitely uh, subscribe to our channel. If you're already subscribed, your job is to find one person in the next two weeks, tell them about our channel, and get them to subscribe. So we're definitely we're definitely on a, a bit of a recruitment push here leading up to some. We've got so many great topics. Brian, our list 
has like doubled of topics that we're going to cover just in the last week of asking people. So there's so much going on. And I am so excited that as soon as we get off here, I'm actually going to go and do some planning for the next one. <laughs> so there's just so much going on. Uh, I keep saying that. So I, that's, that's why I usually script my bit because otherwise I ramble. So anyway, Bob Handlin, Billy Holmes, our guests for today. Thank you both so much for joining. Thank you so much for talking about Stratus. Uh, it's definitely been in the works for a while. I know I joked about that right off the top of my head, uh, right off the top of the show, but I, uh, you know, mean mean no ill intent there. This is a this is a file system tool, or sorry, that's that term's overloaded. This this is a data management solution for for file systems, and uh, you know we got to get it right because logging in one day and not having any of your data kind of not a a good a good sign. So Bob, Billy, thank you both for joining us. Uh, it's great. Thank you all in the audience for joining us. I saw over over uh, twenty people at our peak today. So great to see live interaction. The chat was on fire today. Thank you all uh, for interacting in the chat. Uh, and with that said, on behalf of our guests Bob and Billy, on behalf of my co-host Brian, the entire Rel and Red Hat family, thank you all for joining us. I've been your host Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks. Make sure to like, subscribe, and tell a friend. And we will see you all in two weeks.